So what are we here for? Down hall. Down hall. About what? Quality life. Yep. We're in about quality life. Uh, so, so, you know, about six months ago, you know, we brought this team in, uh, looked at everything that we had, and they came back with recommendations. Uh, there's a handful of things that, that we could do uh, as an enterprise, uh, all the way up to the higher headquarters of the Army, all the way to the chief of staff of the Army and the secretary of the Army. Uh, to improve your quality of life. Uh, so I'm not going to spoil uh, everybody else's comments, uh, but we've made a lot of gains over the past uh, six months you know, in reference to barracks, defects, transportation on posts, uh, commissary. You know, your team here uh, is working very hard to ensure that you get uh, the right care, uh, medical care, uh, the right facilities to live in, uh, and everything that you need to, to thrive uh, in the United States Army Alaska, Fairbanks, uh, in the interior of Alaska. As we know, this is not an easy place to come to if you've never been here before. Uh, this is my first time to Alaska, uh, and we struggle in a lot of ways with coming up, and, and people shouldn't uh, be unprepared when they get to Alaska. So, here's going to be the rules of engagement. Uh, there's what's called a catch box. So everybody see those little uh, little boxes in the back? So if you have a question, okay, they are going to walk over and they're going to chuck it up to you like a baseball. Uh, you just need to catch it, uh, not let it hit somebody in the head, uh, and speak into that uh, funny little box, and it's going to come over the microphones or come over the speakers so everybody can hear your question. So you might have any questions for me uh, right after that. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, and there's uh, we've got a handful of uh, uh, our, our teammates here that have three by five cards. If you don't want to speak your question out loud, uh, go ahead and reach out to them. Uh, they'll get you a piece of paper or write it down on a piece of paper and hand it to them, and we will uh, make sure it gets read and we will do our best to answer it today uh, or immediately following. Uh, this is also on Facebook, uh, being broadcast on Facebook Live. So if you want to ask your question on that, we will do our best to answer that as well. So, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Major General Andrew Gay. All right, good evening, guys. Hear me okay in the back? Okay, great. Got a thumbs up. All right, so uh, here we've got, uh, we got some great information to go out tonight. Um, so, the Sergeant Major, so for old people that use Facebook, right, that's our thing. I'm, I'll tell you right now, so go to Facebook, right, and then pull off our Twitter account, and then pull off uh, Instagram, right? So, we set these things up so we can start getting this information out other ways. Uh, and the U.S. Army Alaska webpage is now all being consolidated in one place as well, right? So, we're trying to tune up, right, the, the venues or media that we use to put information out. All right, but we need you guys to also get out there with us and then let us know all right, uh, some of the challenges that we have out there and then provide feedback on areas where we try to illuminate all right, what it is that we're doing. Okay, So we're trying to meet you out there. I need you guys to, to meet us as well. All right, so there's been a lot of uh, interest in U.S. Army Alaska. So you know the chief was here on September 11th. All right, the chief of staff of the Army, he was just here last week as well. He stopped in and then the Secretary of the Army uh, and the Sergeant Major of the Army here on 27 January. So they all got the, the full read on uh, Fort Wainwright and uh, some of the things that we're working on, right? And then they've all reiterated their support for us. And uh, the U.S. Army Alaska staff, which you'll see some of them uh, talk to you tonight, but you're going to hear a lot from the, from the garrison commander tonight, probably spends about 60% of the time working. Uh, there are probably 30 plus initiatives. Uh, across Alaska, but I'll tell you, most of those pertain to Fort Wainwright, and we're going to give you an update on, on those. Uh, the Corps Commander just changed out, so Lieutenant General George will be up here the first week in March. Right, so every one of these new commanders, we had General Cameron in December of all made Alaska, their first priority, and then they're all committed right, to follow through on a number of initiatives that we do have. So I appreciate uh, you taking the time to be here. Some of you were told to be here. I made sure that the chain of command, first sergeant, company commander on up, right? So what I need you to do is take notes. 
right? The reason why we do these town halls is to flatten this information sharing out. Uh, this is also a housing town hall. We can throw that in there as well. So we've got some housing questions and, and challenges. Uh, bring those up. I need you to take that back, share it with your soldiers, your peers that didn't make it, take it back and share it with families, right? And then I need you to encourage them to get out on social media where we try to advertise as much uh, of the things that we got going on. All right, so we got a great cast that are, that are going to come up here today and, and talk to you about the number of initiatives and then I'll fill in any holes in the end. Uh, and then we'll also uh, have an opportunity briefly uh, to, to take some questions. Uh, so I'll follow up with uh, the Garrison Commander, Colonel Rudolph. Thank you, Colonel. Okay, so as uh, General Andrzejczyk said, we, we have a ton of stuff that has happened. So we haven't done this venue for since December. In the last two months, uh, the team across Ustrak and, and Garrison has worked on an absolute ton of things. I have a large uh, stack of papers here that, that detail all that stuff. So I'll try to get the highlights without boring, boring everybody. So you ask uh, during the Epicon uh, survey, one of the things that came out of that was in particular was uh, Light or blackout shades, too much light in the barracks in the uh, summer. You, you ask for blackout shades, you say we're going to get blackout shades. Those blackout shades have been ordered. They'll be here in the next couple of weeks to start getting installed. And we'll have blackout shades in every occupied barracks room by May. And then we will finish up with the uh, unoccupied barracks rooms, and uh, those are being renovated. Uh, so, good news for you there. Happy lights. Um, so, for the dark side of things, we do have 500 uh, happy lights have been ordered. Uh, projected arrival date is the 27th of this month. As soon as we get those, we will project, uh, we'll send out uh, information on how you can and where you can check those out, but you'll be able to check those out for extended periods of time. Um, so this is, a, again, in no particular order here. Uh, we have a Catholic chaplain that arrived this month, and the reason we have it, or this past week, and the reason we have a Catholic chaplain is directly tied to quality of life because we were able to the normal uh, catholic chaplain is 125 chaplain is deployed uh, we were able to get a reserve chaplain to come in for uh, 365 days uh, so we have our catholic community is, uh, is a priest that is able to serve uh, mass and the last one started or the most recent one started this past week uh, Communication, uh, General Andrzejczyk mentioned the uh, websites that we've consolidated, that are consolidated under one U.S. Army Alaska website. You can get to every installation and get the information you need on particular installations there. We also have a digital uh, garrison application. So we are one of 10 pilot installations across the Army that is uh, piloting or doing a beta testing and piloting a uh, installation management command app. Uh, we've got 50 te pilot testers uh, from across the installation of wide swath of demographics that will start this month and into March, uh, really doing a bunch of uh, proofing of, of that app, making sure the information that is on it is accurate, valid, and it functions properly. And then in the April time frame, don't have a specific date, but in April was Incom's target date to have the app published on the Android and Apple um, app source. So you'll be able to go on and download the app. And that will be a continuous uh, improvement over the over the summer, but that, that's when the initial launch is. And then as we get more uh, functionality with that, uh, we'll be able to get more better information to everybody. Uh, we've talked a lot about MWR facilities. So this past two weeks, we had a project uh, validation assessment team, a contract team that's uh, made up of uh, designers and architects from IMCOM, uh, Installation Management Command. They spent two weeks here on the ground looking at our facilities, uh, talking with focus groups, talking with soldiers, family members, uh, gathering all kinds of data, as well as developing concept designs for the things that we've asked. So the pro some of the projects that they worked on uh, were a refresh of the warrior zone, and we talked some of the details on that before, that did, uh, for both sides, uh, both the, the bar restaurant side and the gaming side will be reworked. Uh, the bowling center, a refresh, complete refresh of the bowling center. Um, we talked about building 3700 and what we want to do, the old Mac Federal Credit Union, and what we want to do with that is make it a uh, indoor park. Uh, so they took, took a look at that and what they can do with that facility. Um, 
They also, at the direction of uh, uh, Army Material Command and Income, uh, looked at a water park, uh, the potential of what a water park would look like here. And so on the water park, I would caveat that, that is not an absolute done deal. But I would say that in uh, last week, uh, General Perna, uh, during one of his uh, interviews, kind of said, hey, we can do these, we can do all kinds of stuff at different installations. Why couldn't we do a water park with a private, you know, public private venture type of thing? At Fort Wainwright. So, as the Army looks at different types of funding sources and the ways to get after things, that is definitely something that we are looking at and considering. And uh, if uh, funds become available, that's uh, a lot of folks would be happy about that. Um, new equipment. As you came in the, uh, the gym tonight, you saw a whole bunch of boxes out there. That is equipment. We, we talked last time we met that there were $910,000 in new equipment that has been ordered for this gym and uh, Malayan Fitness Center. So that equipment has started to flow in. Some of that equipment has been installed already. We've got some spin bikes that have been installed. We've got some, uh, uh, a bunch of ellipticals went into Malayan last week. Those ellipticals have the capability to have cable um, attached to them. The team right now is uh, working through the process to get that cable hooked up. Um, the rest of this uh, equipment um, will be installed in phases. So, so a whole bunch of it, so we have 28 ellipticals and uh, 18 uh, recumbent and upright bikes that will be installed last week of February. We've got a contractor coming in to install those. Uh, we've also got a, I'll do a quick rundown of what all is coming in. Um, so we've got 20 of our 38 spin bikes, 10 of 19 assault bikes, 8 of 13 rowers, 27 of 30 treadmills, uh, 3 of 4 step mills, uh, we've got 3 of 3 uh, ski herbs, and uh, we've still got seven Jacob's Ladders that are due in. And that's just on the cardio equipment. We've also got some, uh, some weight equipment that is, is still due in. So bottom line, we'll have get continuous updates on this as we get uh, new equipment installed. Um, right now we've got some, and then uh, you'll, have, you'll see a whole bunch of changes here in the next two weeks to get to the end of February. Uh, Army Community Service, we've been able to hire two additional Army Community Service uh, employees that will help with a wide range of services that they provide. Um, so that is a good news story for the entire installation. Um, entertainment events that uh, MWR has been able to do in concert with Army Entertainment, Armed Forces Entertainment, and USO. So during the month of December, uh, we had an additional comedy night. Nugget Lanes had a big event for New Year's Eve. Uh, there was live band karaoke. If you missed live band karaoke at the Warrior Zone, it was quite the event. Um, you can go check it out on Facebook, it's still out there on, on some places. Um, NFL, there were a group of six NFL cheerleaders here. Um, on the 1st of February, they taught, uh, did a cheerleading clinic for youth. And then on the 2nd of February, three of them were here, three of them went to Ileson and uh, watched the Super Bowl and spent time at the Warrior Zone with, uh, with our soldiers. Um, coming up in the near future on the 21st of February, headphone disco at the Warrior Zone. As we get into March, uh, at a date to be determined yet, because uh, somewhere mid-March, the end of the ski season, we'll have March Madness, uh, which will really close out the uh, virtual ski season with Gusto. Um, April, we've got uh, Easter Extravaganza, and then in June, we'll have a big open access, uh, community access event here on the installation. Uh, historic aircraft, uh, food trucks, and ending with a large concert. We're very close to being able to announce who that uh, large concert is going to be for the 26th of June, so uh, keep your ears tuned to that event. And then uh, during the summer, we're looking to have a summer concert series in which we have one concert uh, per month uh, throughout the summer through August. Uh, day rooms. We talked we talked previously about day rooms, and we're going to update the day rooms. So what's been done on the day rooms, we currently have a contract with uh, it's out for design work, all those rooms are being designed, uh, for 52 of them, and then construction will be scheduled to start this summer, and it will take about a year, year and a half to get through all 50 day rooms across, uh, 52 day rooms across the installation, but that will start this summer. Um, room cooling study, one of the comments that uh, we talked about previously was, uh, especially on the upper floors of, uh, of the barracks, and especially on the southern side where you get summer sun, that they get, get quite hot. So what we've done, we've got a contractor that's coming in to take a look at all of the barracks and find the best, most efficient ways that we can get after cooling. And some of this 
may, may or may not be air conditioning. Some of the electrical and some of the buildings are quite old, and so there may be some other ingenious ways that we can get after uh, cooling uh, barracks rooms. So that's what that study will look at. Uh, we'll get the results of that study uh, scheduled for the 28th of May based on the contract. Um, Hangar 1. Hangar 1, so the uh, west side of Hangar 1 has been cleared out by a gray eagle back in the uh, end of September, October time frame uh, with their new, now they have their new hangar. That side will become uh, the ACFT, the primary ACFT training area. Um, what will go into that area is about a 128 by 100 foot uh, turf infield and a five lane, 130 meter uh, rubberized track. Um, and along with all the other AC, ACFT apparatus. Um, Timetable we're on right now is the work would start on that in April and would be complete and fully functional by August. All right, so I've got a few um, housing items. Uh, as General Andrzejczak said, we talked talk a little bit about housing. So some of the things that have uh, been discussed on the housing side of things in, uh, in the past are Discolored water and what, what's being done with discolored water. So, in the last month, the uh, Doyen Utilities commissioned two new 500,000 gallon fresh water tanks. This is about 1 million gallons of fresh water storage capacity that we did not more than we had before. So, what was happening before, we'd have uh, pretty much um, we'd have uh, water surges going through the pipes and going through the filters that would stir up some of the sediment in the pipes and depending on high usage. Uh, so this will allow us to stabilize the flow of the water through the uh, system, stir up less sediment, and theoretically have a significantly less uh, discolored water. We will still have, uh, during pipe uh, flushing in the spring, we still will have some of that uh, discolored water as we get the uh, hydrants flushed. But what we'll do for uh, the communities, we'll make sure that we have a very concerted plan. We don't have a lot last year as we did unidirectional flushing, flushing all the sediment to the end of the lines. And as we do that this year, we'll capitalize on what we learned from those studies last year and make sure that by neighborhood by neighborhood, you know when those flushings are gonna take place and what you can expect uh, from your water for specific periods of time. Um, pest control, uh, Doyon, uh, Doyon Utilities have been doing a lot of uh, pest treatments. So specifically in the Bear Paw and Southern Cross subdivisions, uh, we are currently in Bear Paw, uh, Quarterly treat, you know, quarterly treatment maintenance plan and monitoring the number of uh, pest complaints to make sure that uh, those treatments are effective. So if you are in housing and you do experience uh, have see pests, in particular the roaches, um, please let North Haven know. They are tracking it on an everyday basis. I get a report every day this number of new uh, uh, pest comments. Lately it's been very down, um, to one in a week or two. Um, so I take that as a positive sign because it was up significantly earlier in the year, but I don't want to get lulled into complacency just because folks aren't reporting. So if those, there are other things, let us know, and hopefully this continues. And then, and so in Southern Cross, um, treatments start in November, um, and they will continue through February through a couple of additional treatments, and then we'll go into a monitor mode uh, to see how those uh, treatments, how effective those treatments work. And then a final overarching thing on housing, um, just this month, the uh, Resident Advisory Board for North Haven uh, had its first meeting on the 5th. Uh, we have three communities that are represented by a resident advisor for North Haven communities, and this is Denali, Take the Gardens, and North Haven. And North Haven solicited uh, interested community members to be community representatives. Um, what those community representatives would do is ideally be able to have conversations with folks in their neighborhood and provide an additional means to communicate with North Haven and articulate uh, concerns and recommendations to North Haven. This is in addition to your ability to go direct to North Haven via the app, via uh, telephone, um, or uh, through ICE comments. So this is just an additive thing. Um, so for those communities, you've got somebody, I would, and the name should have come out uh, to you via uh, your community emails, and then we, will we with North Haven will continue to make sure that you know who those folks are. For the other communities, we didn't get any interested parties volunteering. And so I would ask, if you don't live in one of those communities and you would like a say and an additional, an additional voice in how your community is supported by North Haven communities and the garrison, they consider volunteering. Reach out to, to North Haven, let them know you're interested, and then 
can get you in that process. These are elected positions, so once you uh, are nominated, your community does a, yep, I agree that person is a good person to be, uh, to represent, potentially represent our community, and then if there are more than one uh, nomination, there will be a vote for that uh, to approve whoever that representative is for your community. So those are the, the big updates that I have. Um, I do have a couple of questions that were pre-submitted on the housing front that I'd like to like to answer. So recently, Sheena Bend, some of the houses in Sheena Bend underwent some renovation. North Haven had a open house about two weeks ago for anybody who was interested in uh, seeing what those renovations look like, and uh, they're, they're quite substantial. Um, so one of the questions was that the storm was removed. And this is something that was done uh, very consciously um, on North Haven's part uh, that from a cost and a repeat damage perspective. However, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, with, it, with that, we were actually going to go back and have a communication and a conversation with North Haven on the ability to for airflow in particular quarters, recognizing that in some, some quarters, that storm door is one of the only, if not the only, uh, airflow area on a side of a house. So we'll go back and take a look at that and make sure that it makes sense. That was the resident's concern of eliminating airflow in uh, on a side of a house. So that's where we're at with that. Um, ceiling fans were removed in a couple of the, uh, in the kitchen and dining area. Um, and somebody noticed that as they were going through the walkthroughs. Um, that was an oversight on the contractor's part and North Haven has already said that that's going to be a correction. So uh, folks that will move into those uh, Sheena Bend housing will have uh, fans there. And the question came about uh, from North Haven if they would consider putting a dog park on the north side post. So they've got a dog park on the south side post, and North Haven's uh, answer to that is they will absolutely consider looking to uh, developing a dog park for the residents that are on the north side of the installation. So those are the updates that I have, and as we get into question time here in uh, a few minutes, uh, I'll be happy to answer anything else we've got. Followed by Good evening, everybody. Okay, so um, all the uh, we continue to do improvements to the DFAT and we're trying to make things easier. So when we started this, the basic allowance of food every day was fourteen twenty eight. In October, we increased that to ten percent. And that amount became 1657. Starting from February this year, we increased all the way up to 25%, and that now is $20.64. So, what all this means to you? This means that we are going to be able to get better quality food. We are going to be able to increase the amount of food that we serve you for milk and trace, protein. Uh, protein, um, a specialty bar, healthier food that support the Go For Green initiative, meaning more veggies, more greens. And also we are increasing uh, the selection in the salad bar. And I know you all probably are seeing that throughout the week. Um, by mid-March, we are going to complete the replacement of the furniture. The decor is moving as it's moving along. We got the TVs. Uh, this week we are going to get the um, art that is going to be played between the TVs. Uh, we got the air fryer. Uh, we have two new stations for coffee and juice that is already installed. Uh, I know that if you guys notice the USB ports that are next to the tables, and we continue to provide the Wi-Fi free Wi-Fi service. And then you are seeing the uh, so those are the things for the current repack right now. Moving on to the tour that is going to be in building 1001. It's going to be effective or operational on April. Uh, that is going to be open for soldiers and civilians. That was the question that was for us last time. And the initiative there is to have a grab and go concept with pre-packaged food that soldiers can go grab, swipe by the car, and then you to go. You can move home with your daily business. Okay, so that those are the updates for the new pack. Now I'm going on to transportation, to so the on-call services that the uh, 
one to five is being provided right now. So we're going to have a contractor to assume the service. It starts on 7 March. We're going to have two plans to provide all those services to all, mostly all the places on post. That means the gyms, the DFAT, that means to the hospital, to library, to uh, motor pools, back to the barracks, back to whatever you want to do. The service is going to be from Monday to Friday from 6 to 2100. And on weekends, it's going to be from 09 to 2100. We also are going to have a shuttle bus that is going to be from 06 to 1400. But the location for that shuttle bus is going to be the motor pools, the DFAT, and the gym only. So you have like a route that during those hours only. Now, we are going to be able to take in class off post only for medical appointments. That's the only time that we can go off post. And also, if the NWR is sponsoring an event, let's say movie night at the local theater, but again, it's sponsored by the NWR, we can take the show buses and take the family and take the soldiers and the spouse to the movies and then bring them back home. Those are the only two options to go off post. Okay, I'll be around here again if any questions that you guys have for me. Okay. Good evening, everyone. So I know many of you from we've had a, a several of these town halls. You've heard me talk about the behavioral health intensive outpatient program as a, a new program that we're bringing to Fort Wainwright, expanding our services. Want to give you an update on that because that actually kicked up on the 6th of January. And I appreciate all of those that were involved in that. Uh, I know there are several commanders out there who've uh, already helped supporting with the number of soldiers that we have enrolled in this program. So if you remember what this program is, it uh, offers um, what we call step up care and what we call step down care. And step up care is maybe someone needs to meet with the provider more than a couple times a week. This intensive program means that the folks are actually enrolled for a four week period with four hours a day, usually in the morning. So they're able to do PT with your units in the morning, go to this uh, training with their behavioral health team uh, in the morning and then report back to the units in the afternoon. And I know it's a significant commitment, uh, four weeks, but I also understand and appreciate everybody's support in it that we're talking that in definite that this is a short-term investment for a definite long-term uh, gain from this with our uh, folks getting back after readiness. Uh, so I just want to make sure everybody understands that this is not a self-referral program. This is something that we have a health provider in conjunction with the director of the IOP come together and determine what's a good fit for folks to make a recommendation to the command. So we just ask the command be open to this program. We are willing to work with you on start dates. So I know sometimes there's different uh, taskings that happen and we have worked with company commanders say, I can't do it, just can we wait one week? And we've been able to work through that. So realize that the team over at Behavioral Health is very flexible and understands and trying to meet everybody's needs on this. Um, give you another piece. Um, we've been talking a while about the shortages in child, adolescent, and uh, family behavioral health. So we were able to make one more addition to the team. We're still short. Um, we're working through a lot of different hiring initiatives, and I will say uh, with General Andrzejewski's so help, working through a lot of different, with the Undersecretary of the Army getting after some different policy changes for Alaska as a whole, making it a little easier to get some of our um, very difficult to recruit shortages across the United States getting some uh, medical providers up here in Alaska. So we continue to get after that on multiple fronts. Um, what I'm seeing is we have multiple uh, providers selected. It's a matter of getting them up here in probably the next three to four months. So look forward to telling you more about that in the future town halls. One other item I'd like to talk about, appointments. I've talked to you about before, try here online, and you can go on and make your appointments, as well as you can go on and cancel your appointments. What I do want to talk a little bit about today is uh, canceling of appointments. Um, I'll tell you, for the month of December, we had a little over 1,600 appointment cancellations, with 57% of those being active service numbers. Uh, 
The majority of them were seen in specialty care, which was behavioral health and physical therapy. What happens when you cancel the day of, the chances of getting somebody into that appointment is very slim to none. So if you can be proactive, I understand life happens, kids get sick, your spouse gets sick, certain things happen. I understand things happen at work where you suddenly have to change. If you have any ability to predict that out a little further and give yourself a few more days to be proactive in canceling that appointment so it becomes open to somebody else in the community that really needs those services, I would greatly appreciate your help on that. Another piece that we're, is happening, if you come into the hospital, you're going to start seeing some new work happening in our area of pharmacy, radiology, as well as laboratory. We're putting in what's called a new Q-flow or patient streaming process. Um, this is where you're going to be able to check in with your ID card via a kiosk, and you'll be called up and you'll be able to start seeing some instant uh, on top, on monitor be able to tell where you're at in the process. So if we talk about pharmacy, how long it's taking you from check-in to the time you're able to get your meds, and you can very quickly see what are the estimated wait times. You can even get a text message update to say, I don't have time to wait for this, but I know that my meds are done and I can spend my after work and go ahead and pick up the meds. Um, so that's something that will probably be here about mid-March. Uh, other pieces of services that we're bringing, we continue to work with our community partners at bringing additional services up here. We've been working with our sister services as well as our civilian partners in trying to expand our telehealth options and what is available. One thing that I know, I know right now because of flu season, we're at the peak of it. We've got the ER has been full. I think like the ER has had three and four hour waits pretty consistently, uh, as well as the pediatrics have been very full because of flu season. Um, in partnership with our civilian partners, we had, there's a uh, folks out there called Pediatrics Anywhere. This is an app you can download on your phone. You can make an appointment with a pediatrician. This is a program based out of Anchorage. You can FaceTime with the physician. Um, you can upload pictures. So this also just gives some extra capacity where we're a little short and strained right now because it is flu season. So on top of that, I will remind you, preventative hand washing, Right, all of those things you would normally do to for folks that are sick not to come to work, um, you know, continue to uh, what I call a little bit of sequester, make sure you're decontaminating your house as, as well as just try to uh, not further expose folks. So just realize that if you're coming into the ER right now, it's full of the flu if you don't want to be exposed to the flu, all right? Especially for folks that are coming in for more routine issues. So look forward, as always, uh, I'm here afterwards to answer any questions that you may have. Um, feel free also to bring up note cards. I have a lot of folks that tend to give me more um, personal issues that they're having maybe with the medical system that I can help uh, facilitate closure on that piece. So thank you for your time. Uh, good evening. So uh, strike first. So um, I'm going to talk a couple specifics uh, to the brigade. Acknowledging up front, we've got soldiers here uh, from across USRAC. Uh, so really, the intent here is is to, to put out a couple messages uh, for the brigade, but really to also uh, provide an example of kind of our effort to get after the CG's initiative of predictability. That was some of the feedback from uh, that one that got was predictability. Uh, transparency uh, and good uh, open communication. So right now, uh, specific to the brigade, the task force will move forward. So the uh, brigade commander Colonel Brown, Command Sergeant Major Ladd, and seven battalions continue to get after it down the range. And so uh, what we're doing back here uh, is enabling uh, that effort forward to produce results really for the president. Um, so a couple things. One, we continue troop rotations, right? So Bobcat, uh, Charlie Munson uh soldiers are continuing to move forward here for the next couple months. Uh, we just finished up, uh, and this is across all the battalions and all the brigades uh, in USRAC here to see when our soldiers are back uh, home safe and sound from that. So other than Arctic Edge, which is upcoming, uh, we've got a, a, a brigade about 75 soldiers really across USRAC, uh, many more soldiers, which is a couple days in the field. The brigade, a uh, pretty predictable schedule upcoming. So no overnight training, no weekend training, uh, and, and really no night training unless uh, unless if there's a deliberate uh, discussion. Right now, none of that's approved. So the intent is to get after that predictable schedule. Why? Because Colonel Brown asked us to set conditions for the reintegration of his brigade uh, in the summer of 2020. And surprisingly, that's not that far away. Although 
pretty cold outside. Uh, the redeployment of the brigade is coming quickly. And so we sat through a brief just yesterday uh, as Colonel Brown was briefing the CG. Uh, it's called it's called a D minus one twenty, but the truth is the brigade's coming back uh, a, a few days short of that. So uh, it's not that far away. Uh, and I bring it up because in the near future we'll see eyeball flights, we'll see main body flights start to come back. We kind of set expectations and, and have a common understanding of what that's going to look like across really the entire community. The entire community comes together. Uh, to, to welcome home uh, a unit this size coming out of the fight. And so there has been a deliberate discussions and thoughtful planning put together for this reintegration of the brigade here uh, in the near future. And it will be based on years of lessons learned about how we redeploy a uh, number of half days and long weekends. But it's not quite as simple as you come out of the fight and then you go on to a long period. It is going to be focused on kind of that reintegration, uh, how we transition out of the forward fight back to garrison. Uh, getting after medical uh, requirements, counseling, pay, all those kinds of things, reintegrations with families and so forth. That's going to that's going to allow us then to get into the month of June, where uh, Colonel Brown has set aside a week for the times to get after the organizational days and things like that. That we talked about in the past. Of, Why don't I have this? Why aren't we doing more of that? Uh, he set that aside, followed by a work week. So throughout the month of June, organizational days, so Wolf Week where we got unit uh, competitions and, and so forth, uh, a lot of transition of leadership, uh, but a very predictable uh, schedule throughout the month of June, which leads into what most people uh, are looking forward to, which is a, a long, uh, well-deserved block leave, 3 through 26 July, which is for the entire brigade. You got a lot of questions of, are the four people going to come back, they're going to take block leave, we're just going to keep working. No. Uh, I've asked for exceptions at times and been told flat out no. So the brigade will take block leave in July uh, and then we'll transition into kind of individual training get after a, uh, our glide path into uh, into the fall and, and the winter after. So what I will do is Sergeant Major Rich and I are going to meet with every task force within the brigade here in a couple of weeks. So we're going to sit down by task force and do what we'll call a town hall but really lay out the details of that reintegration and then the details of what that summer schedule looks like after the after the uh, uh, final briefings to the CG here in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and then to, to head off a couple of the questions really tied to our family time, so I've heard this a couple of times today. Um, I will be here afterwards with Sergeant Major Pritchett hanging out here and thanking you over there uh, to talk any soldiers in the brigade who who have not received our family time. And I caveat that with, I sat down with soldiers for sensing sessions at lunch just a few weeks ago, and I said, have you been receiving our family time? And they said, absolutely not. I have no idea what that is. And my next question was, what time did you leave last Friday? And the answer was around 15, 15, 10. I said, that's our family time. Now, uh, sometimes you gotta piece, those, uh, piece that together a little bit, but, I, but uh, no doubt there are soldiers, unless you're, you know, if you're on staff duty, extra duty, uh, or some things like that, yeah, you probably didn't get our family time. If you've been in JRTC, you didn't get our family time. And that's, I, I hope, understandable from that perspective. But we're going to wait around afterwards and really talk about that piece, because that gets into the CG intent of predictability. We're getting uh, payday activities the first Friday of the month, and two our family times each month. Even if it's not a Friday, like this week, Thursday is our family time. And as and I have made an effort to go around and kick people out of buildings, uh, to kind of make sure that uh, leaders are getting after that. So we'll be around for questions after. That's good, because that was a question I, I was given. Our family time and uh, paid activities. So I'll talk about that here in a second. We kind of wrap this all up, and then what we'll do is we'll take questions from uh, those that are attending. We'd much rather hear from you since you took the time to be here. All right, and then we'll address some of the ones that probably came up in the card. So let me just, we just talk about, we kind of rehash the family, morale, welfare, recreation side of things. So what Colonel Ruben said is a million dollars worth of gym equipment, right, is almost all here. Okay, and that's really for two gyms, right? So the PFC, right, the facility we're in now, and Malayla, right? So you'll see that in there, and they're going to spiral out some of this equipment to uh, the unit, Chris, and some of the unit gyms, right, the unit sanctioned yes. gyms. Yeah. We'll spiral the stuff that's in here down there so you can upgrade down to your unit footprint um, as well, right? You already have 2747 access to uh, the Wolf Slayer, right? This is the one that is next on the list, but this one requires a little bit more hardware. Uh, much like we have got a gym here where it's a cat card or it's a card you get issued that allow you to get in the gym to use the new equipment, 
right? We realize that you need a new gym, right? It's more than just the gym that we're in now. It is a massive uh, facility. So what Colonel Ruda was talking about, right, with this indoor pool, right, it's got the lazy river and everything else. You know, we got some of that down at Jay Bear. There is a vision for this. I hear it all the time from the Chief of Staff of the Army, General Perna, right? So they're committed to making the right investment here. Now, when the Secretary of the Army came up, um, he was pretty clear is that they're looking at uh, different ways to make sure that we can fund this thing so we can do it quicker. Because if it's under military construction, right, and working through uh, the, the typical process to build facilities, that takes a while. We know that you need that sooner versus later. So I, I'm, I'm telling you, they're, they're committed to looking at innovative ways to get these facilities uh, in here quicker. But we're also looking at how do we get something better here in the near term. Okay, so part of it is the equipment. Right? The other piece that will follow is you're going to hear this term called combat readiness training facilities. Right? So there are already two that are under contract. Right? If you've been to the 10th Mountain Division, you understand with these somewhat temporary facilities, they last for uh, many years. Right? We're planning on some of these things lasting 10 years. There's already two that are under contract. Okay? And then we also received $32 million for two separate things. Part of it is other combat readiness training facilities that we should see somewhere probably here in a couple of months. That get put up that looks something similar to what you would have in Afghanistan, right? But you're going to have an indoor facility to go and do PT, right? End of March, early April is when you're going to see your uh, ACFT equipment rolling here, right? So you'll see some of that stuff go in there, right? So that is the bridging strategy that some of the near term approaches, right, that we're working, right? Understand that you need a much bigger facility with an indoor track, right? But we already talked about Hangar One, what we're doing there in Hangar One, so that's another facility that you have available. Right, so there are a number of things that are coming in uh, that you'll be able to, to leverage. You talked about all the, the, the entertainment, you talked about all the investment in other areas. So one of the buildings that he talked about um, was the family recreation facility. So that is the old credit union building where they got a plan, the community's been involved in scoping this thing out. That's where spouses can go with their kids. The spouses can exercise, the kids can go and play. But this new facility that we will eventually want to put in here all right, we're going to try to get some equity with what Ielson has and what Javier has, right? So that is out there. There's a, there's a commitment to build that, but that, that will not be delivered here in the next couple of years. But the renovation of this facility will get us a near-term solution for that, right? Arctic family time, right? So the question I got was, when do we get released for uh, payday activities? So right now, it's penciled in for 1300 but payday activities. Remember, there's a couple things you asked for. Counseling and an investment in you. So KD activities are supposed to be an investment in you, right? So in some cases, there's going to be counseling. It may or may not result in you being released at 1300. All right, family time is an early release, and that is the second and fourth, um, last day of the work of the work week on the second and fourth. So this Thursday, you should be released at, at 1500. Um, so I talked through readiness facilities. When I mentioned the $32 million, and there's a couple of these gyms that will come in, which we call CRTS, the other challenge that you had is how do I do the maintenance on my equipment when it's sitting on a motor pool is frozen? Okay, the other facilities, okay, are facilities to put their, your vehicles in, so they're, they're in a temperature controlled environment. We call them uh, winter maintenance facilities, is the, I think the term that we're used for it now. At one time, it was uh, really a storm facility we're trying to get these so you put your largely most of your equipment that is in there so you can go and maintain it year round all right and improve the readiness right so that's that's good news there um what was mentioned by Colonel Restrepo about the defects look you got a kiosk going in to a thousand one and that thing should be done we're looking at by at the time the brigade is rolling back in here and you start filling those barracks up right as that thing ideally uh, rolls out there's another defect, right, that is currently under renovation that we think April, May time frame is going to come up online and it's a complete renovation and that will be the main dining facility. The current dining facility that you eat in, right, will become the Culinary Arts Center where we make an investment, right, in our food service specialists where they go and get additional training and there's potential of another kiosk in there. So there's multiple places that you can go to and get food. All right, and the vision is is that you're going to get restaurant quality food in these dining facilities, and that's something that we're putting a lot of emphasis on. What Colonel Restrepo mentioned was the increase in the dollar amount authorization per soldier so that you can buy more and high quality foods, 
right? And there's the, the logistics community is committed to delivering those high quality foods and getting them up there and expanding the menu choices. Um, and then we've talked about, hey, look, we've got to find a better way to get this out. I don't think you want to come to a gym, all right, once a month, although we've got a pretty good way of getting information out. I need you to get up on all our social media platforms. We hired a social media specialist to help us out with this. Okay, the website the information will be available on this consolidated website when this app rolls out, right? It's gonna be a pretty good deal that hits a number of areas, right? So that we flatten information sharing, uh, not just at Fort Wayne, right? I bought, I bought a world in also, which was based on the door of Richardson, and we got uh, uh, Greeley in there as well. So we got one place uh, to get information from. And then the other part I'll add on there, right? And I'll just tell you that, that this is a little bit more tentative only because some of this requires policy change, right? But this leadership of the Army is very receptive and working on this for us is we're looking at financial incentives to offset the costs and come to Alaska, right? So what could that potentially be, right? So part of it could be an assignment incentive pay. You get assigned to Alaska, right? You get a plug of money when you show up here. Um, and that's designed to offset some of your financial burden, right? It's also intended to start attracting uh, more folks up here because the, the ultimate goal is make this a place where people absolutely want to come to. Um, and so that's a, that's a key aspect of that, to, to attracting and maintaining talent. Another piece of that is you get assigned to Alaska, get an assignment of choice following your tour in Alaska, right? And then the other one we're considering all right, and working through this one is even a little bit more challenging. It's this idea that in a three-year tour, you get three, two, two paid trips, and the location that we had to put into the policy was essentially back to Hawaii. So whatever the cost is that flies you to Hawaii, right, you can take that and go home, all right, wherever you get to that amount of money. So that's those are things that we're working and we'll throw on the table. Our new leadership is uh, very receptive to it. Right? But they're not easy things to do because some of this is DOD policy, not Army policy. So some of these that are in the hands of the Army will come sooner. The others are going to take a little bit of work. All right? But I will tell you that, uh, that like I said, is that we're committed to, to making the change, uh, not just for you here, but also for the rest of the uh, uh, United States Army Alaska. All right, so what I'll do now is open it up to questions for folks that are in the room right now. DCG's got a question already. Okay. First, who's willing to stand up before we start the So you, you do have the oldest fleet, right, in the Army right now, right? But there is also consideration when the discussions um, recently because so, so one of the one of the discussions was Army Alaska, the Margin Control Striker Fleet, okay, is potentially accelerating. Right now it's 23. Right now we're supposed to field the double B hole in 23. They're talking about pulling that forward. Okay, um, so there's consideration. That's pulling it in front of a uh, units that are at JPL level in the 758. Right, so um, we have a fleet that we have to fight with, right, and that's what we have right now. So we've got money to continue to work on those, but uh, at some point in time, when those get rotated out, they go back and become the seed corn right for the next version of the double people, so they do a conversion on it. Okay, but for the interim, this is what we have, we've got to continue to work on it um, as they work through potentially pulling the, uh, the modernization forward. 
Okay. Anybody? Uh, there's a case you get. Go ahead. Uh, so one of my questions is and wasn't really addressed uh, that, that I've heard of. Um, so family care for housing, um, child care on post. Uh, my daughter's been on the CDC wait list for about two years now. Uh, she keeps getting bumped back on priority for that list. I don't know if anybody else has had that problem. Um, so do you have any insight on that and how yeah. we can get people bumped? I'll pick on those so, uh, uh, so that's a good question. So a couple things, and the question just came in online as well. So the Army has pulled forward a uh, CDC, a new, new build on the CDC to FY22. Um, Fort Wainwright and, and Hawaii are the only two installations that got those pulled forward. So we'll actually have a planning charrette taking place next month. That's where they do all the design work. Um, and that will be built, constructed in, like I said, FY22. Additionally, we are actively, actively recruiting um, family child care uh, facilities, SCC facilities. We've got nine online with a couple additionals um, in the hopper going through the uh, approval process. Um, and we are actually, we are very close to capacity. We had a lull in a um, number of our employees. Um, and we're very, very rapidly getting back to full capacity on um, employment. So um, we're, we're pretty safe for I think our wait list time right now is, was a, our number of wait lists is 103, but that varies depending on the type of child right now and, and our uh, age of the children and our uh, rates of uh, child to uh, character. So that, that will consistently move Right, so the, the second part of the question that I got was, okay, so if Arctic, why not strike return strike position? Right, so that, that's another one that's also on the table. Okay, and as the Army leadership uh, works through um, their renewed interest uh, in the Arctic and what Alaska, the US Army Alaska needs to be, I'll tell you that what, one of the considerations is if you, it's not rotating the unit out, it's about re, is, is redesigning what the unit looks like, or if you switch it back to a new you know, essentially an IBCT and, and move the striker somewhere else. Right? So there's a, don't, don't go back and say, we're getting rid of the strikers, because that's not. A lot of these studies that they're, they're looking at all options on the table because the discussion uh, that, that is happening right now is are we underinvested in our ability to fight in cold weather? And if the Army feels that they're underinvested, there's consideration, right? Uh, how do we increase the investment and then focus us here? Right? So, for all those cold weather lovers, that would be, be excited about that because that means that uh, you won't necessarily rotate to the National Training Center or the Joint Readiness Training Center. You know, you're going to rotate out to ETA uh, and, and train them. Uh, but that is, a, that is a consideration. Okay, we've got some cards that I can help and address. All right, so I got a bunch of different cards here for uh, from the garrison side. So uh, one of them, if uh, we knew there was sediment in the water, why did not why did we not fix it sooner? So the sediment that is in the water is naturally occurring here in Alaska. It's part of the water table. It's during iron manganese. It's perfectly safe. Um, and what we've done to improve the appearance of the water as it gets uh, is the way on utilities is put these additional water packs in. So it's a huge investment on the part of our utility provider um, and really just going to make things even better for uh, the community here. But again, the water is 100% safe, we tested every single day, um, no issues there. So that um, when will upgrades to the zone bowling alley and Mac uh, slash uh, park occur? Uh, so ideally, we would uh, start on some of those here this summer. Um, again, we're in the design uh, basis of, uh, of most of those. Um, we'll, we'll continue to work. Um, when will new facilities go up? So General Andrzej, I've talked about some of the immediate facilities uh, on the fitness side of things uh, that will go up here starting in the next month or two. Um, 
as far as actual construction, you know, build water park, build field house, build things like that. Uh, realistically, some of those things are going to at least be a year out uh, or more before we get approval on those. Uh, some mill comp projects take a considerable amount of time. Uh, so keep your you know ears tuned to these events, and we'll keep you updated as, as we go. Um, building 1001, always a question: What's going on with 1001? So we did get uh, renovation for 1001 approved. Uh, General timetable is that uh, it will start this summer, uh, toward the end of the summer, and it will take about 18 months for a full renovation. Right now, we are doing repaint, retile, and a general cleanup in, in 1001. So the question uh, is, to, hey, we thought there was more coming to 1001 and not just paint. There is more coming to 1001 and not just paint, but we are doing some general uh, sprucing up right now in the interim. Uh, there is the kiosk, the food kiosk that is currently in construction in 1001. Um, to dispel any rumors, um, the question was, we found out it was a mini shop at. It is not a mini shop at. It is a food kiosk that you'll be able to use your meal card and get healthy food choices right there in 1001. Uh, question about 1004. Is 1004 going to be reopened and renovated? So 1004 is going to be reopened this uh, this spring. Uh, target date is one day to have that back online. That will be brought, brought, back, me, brought back online as a transient barracks. And so as we bring we have the uh, surge of uh, 125 coming back on top of the normal PCS season, we've got a lot of additional barracks requirements for this summer as we get through the summer. So that will be moved back online and that will be transient barracks. And the intent is we will move soldiers in there who are getting ready to PCS. So there are minimal time in 1004 and then they'll PCS and then we will then bring 1004 back offline into a uh, just a, a storage uh, capacity so that we have it for other transient uh, options. Uh, question about would be a paint, how about a paintball course instead of a water park? Okay, we'll, we'll look at a paintball course. Uh, so, are there any plans for apartments to be built on post? Um, currently, there are no plans for North Camp to build apartments, but uh, that is definitely something they're willing to look at um, for out here development plans. I know they have them so there some other installations, and uh, we got information from them tonight that we're we'll willing to look at that. Um, will there be a one mile track in the new, added to the new gym? So um, the goal will be a 200 meter indoor track in the field house, which is a standard indoor track. Uh, right now, as I mentioned in uh, Hangar one, we will have a five lane, 130 meter track. And so that's what we've got to work with right now for facilities. So we'll put the longest track we can possibly put in that facility. And then hopefully we'll, we will have a, a long or a larger field house in the interim. Uh, why water park and not an ACFT facility? We're looking at both. Uh, so in the immediate term, I mentioned Hangar one turning into an ACFT facility. In the long term, a full field house with a infield and meter track. Um, and conceivably be co-located or just adjacent to a water park. Uh, question about why soldiers have to pay for classes at the gym when other army bases don't. So if you're not familiar with the way MWR uh, operates, MWR does have to operate on a part of the business model. So money that you contribute, so when you buy food at uh, an MWR facility or you use the ski hill or you use the golf course, that money goes through partly the operating costs and allowing us to do additional programs. So we, that's one thing we are looking at is the cost for doing uh, classes. Uh, right now we do have minimal costs to do classes and help pay for those uh, trained instructors that allow us to do that. But as we relook the business model in the future years, we'll, we'll look at what trade-offs we can make to potentially reduce the costs there, but realizing that there's, there's a balance to all things as work in the business model to ensure we continue able to upgrade stuff like new trailers and new uh, uh, snow machines and things like that at Outdoor Rec. Uh, we do have to bring in some level of uh, balancing revenue. Uh, how about an indoor uh, dog park because Spyro is cold outdoors? Um, so that is not something that's on the list. Um, I would say that all the construction facilities that will probably be down well below some of these uh, Field houses and uh, water parks and, and other things, but you know, wouldn't say never, never, but uh, good idea, but probably a little further down the list. And then, um, let's see, question about gyms getting Wi Fi. This one came in online as well. Uh, so the MWR is in the process of upgrading the uh, fiber for all for the gyms, and that is absolutely the intent to have Wi Fi in the gymnasiums. Good. 
And let, me, let me highlight, so he's interested in 1001, when he goes into renovation, right, there's some pain involved in that. Right? That's that much less capacity that we have. So, um, so the good news is it's going to get renovated. Bad news is right, there's a capacity issue and it will force you to tighten up in some of your rooms. Hey, look, a number of guys, folks keep asking about uh, our family time. Go see him if you're not getting it at the right time. Right? The other question is, why is it only the second and fourth? Well, the first is daily activities, and usually you get a four-day uh, you get a four-day weekend every month. I'm not sure what else is left. Okay, um, I, I think I think it's pretty generous. Okay, so uh, if you've got a problem with not getting the time that we've laid on the schedule, go see Colonel Lynch or go see your battalion commander. I encourage you to go ahead. I'll hit these quick. Some of them, uh, I think, are specific for getting more work into the other you know, town hall. But uh, discussion about the strikers again. The JLTVs that are inbound are not to replace the striker, to be clear. And we'll talk about the specifics. JLTVs are replacing a number of older version Humvees uh, that we currently have. And that's part of the modernization that this brigade is going to go through here uh, in August and September uh, of the upcoming summer. Uh, and then uh, the CGRE talked the, uh, the storage of military vehicles and the initiative that's ongoing here in the very near future. Uh, but uh, in reference to folks uh, and so forth, we'll talk that offline. Um, question about exemptions for staff duties uh, for some significant MOSs. I, I only caution that, that that's a decision at the battalion level. I caution with once you start making exceptions or exemptions to staff duties. Uh, by MOS, pretty soon there's nobody left to do staff duties and CQs, which is really the number one priority type of force protection that, that we all get after on a daily basis to kind of own our footprint. But uh, we'll talk that uh, separately offline. So. Questions here. Someone had uh, written in asking about uh, cancellation of appointments. Uh, without notification. So I will say I know at Kingish we've had some folks staying out on emergency leave. I know one two five has had some folks providers out on emergency leave also having um, some other issues unforeseen due to other family related issues that uh, uh, life happens. And sometimes we do have to cancel appointments. We make every effort to shift up other providers either from the hospital or the Kingish. Uh, in order to make sure that we're continuing to provide medical services on that. So we do our best and appreciate your patience on that as uh, working to get more folks over there. Um, there's a question here about more dentists. Uh, and I think this is in June talking about, I think this is getting out for the SRP. So realize uh, both Medac and Dentac are working with our partners in managing the SRP, which means uh, also having backfills from both the Guard and Reserve that are coming to help out. Last question somebody asked about uh, why don't we discharge folks uh, for missed appointments? Believe it or not, that's actually been looked at on multiple levels, and that has not ever come to fruition. Um, what I can do, though, is ask you to be good stewards of the limited resources that we have and uh, work to need to cancel appointment, try to do so as far in advance as possible. So again, I'll get right if you have any questions. Thank you. So I do have one that I want to follow up on. So this is a general question that's come up uh, a couple times we had in our car, we got online, actually got an email from Colonel Brown this just past week asking about this. And so it's uh, washers and dryers. So washers and dryers in barracks. Um, I, honestly, I think there's some level of urban legend um, on the washer and dryer in the barracks not being functional. So right now, what Garrison is doing, we are checking every washer and dryer in every barracks every month. And there's uh, two ways uh, washers and dryers get replaced. Either our guys are checking them, noticing there's a problem, and either repairing or replacing them within three days, or your barracks manager is bringing it to DPW's attention, they're sending somebody out, and we're either repairing or replacing them with is. If you're seeing washers and dryers not being uh, maintained, if you're seeing them non-functional, go see your barracks manager and get it in so we can get it fixed. That's what we're asking you to do. Don't just sit and wait for the town hall to say, why aren't the washer and dryers done? It's incumbent on you as residents of your home to see your barracks manager and get that stuff upgraded for better than you and your soldiers. So we will absolutely take care of those, and that's our commitment to you.
Okay, so I have a remedy question from last time we did a long haul. And it's, are we allowed to ask for double serving? Yes, you are. When you are going through the main line and you, let's say, they have fried fish and baked chicken, you can have one of each. Just keep in mind that when you walk out of there, this is not a China house buffet at the downtown. You can have a pile of these. You can go sit down, if you serve it, come back to the line and eat again. So you can eat two or three times. So that is, that is a lot. The second part of the question is why the line takes so long to go to the line. So there is a new system where they have to plug if it's a single soldier, it's a merry soldier, you plug your library card, they have to put this in twenty dollars, one serving, they change this, and every soldier that does that, I think it's a new, I think that duty is a rotation of duty throughout the month. I don't think the soldiers that do that stay there at least a week doing the same, but they get proficiency to move all the keyboards on that machine. That's what I think is the same. So maybe uh, the battalion commander, the set commander, is something we can check on and see maybe something we can do and change maybe once a week or something. But that is the only thing that I can think. That is the reason why the machine is the same. Okay, you can have two servings of chicken, you can have two servings of cake, though. Okay. No, no two servings of cake. All right, well, we're going to look into the process and get through that feedback line quicker. All right, because uh, we want to go through it. Um, all right, so we're going to wrap this up. So unless there's somebody in here that's willing to stand up and ask a question, right, just like we've done in the past, we can solve it when we didn't get asked. Uh, we didn't have an opportunity to answer, right, and we'll get you the answers to it. Or you can come back. Uh, up here and meet certain folks that can answer questions for you. For example, someone said, how long does it take you to sign 4187? It's pretty quick, because it's on my desk, okay? Um, but it's once it's on my desk, right? Things can be walked through, and uh, so the question is, where in the, where in the pipeline is it? So the G1, come here, right here. You've got a 4187 problem. Well, sorry for you, I hope you don't fight the catch. Uh, he'll meet you up here and can talk to you through some of the specifics. Okay, things typically, I know it sits on my desk and there's always a way that I have an auto pin for certain things, right? So it's not like if I'm out of town that things don't get signed. Okay, um, so um, he'll be able to address the specifics. I'm going to turn over to Sergeant Major to, to, to close it out, right? But I, but I do appreciate your time. I just want to go one last try to see if anybody has a burning question they want to ask. Go ahead. Okay. All right, so, so it's a great question, right? And I've seen it in some places where it works really well. Um, it, it'll never relieve the requirement for CQ, but I know that uh, some are putting some emphasis on that. It, it's, it is ex extremely expensive uh, to, to put those in there, right? So uh, we can always up the CQ requirement. How about that? Uh, not a great solution. I just, just come down to Colonel Lynch or whatever battalion we're talking about, right? We'll see what we can do. If there's any other ways that we can get after that, okay? Uh, but I understand the value of having those in the barracks, all right? They, they are helpful. They're helpful in other ways as well, okay? All right. Anybody else? Go ahead. Uh, my question, sir, is there any plans for the Wi-Fi for 1001? Currently, these guys are 175 per month. And during actually going to be like 40 or 50 dollars a month, 175 kind of hard for your equipment. One second, so uh, you know, we talked about 50 day, 55 day rooms are all going to come with Wi Fi. I think you're talking about the room, though, right? Okay, so uh, I think there's no other way to package this thing for the care of the providers. So the, the plan right now, as CD said, is that we get Wi-Fi in all the common areas, but as far as your room, your residence, just like if you were an apartment off post, um, your choice of what you want. And I recognize that it is incredibly expensive for that up here. That also goes back to what General Kriegsack was talking about with those additional entitlements uh, that we're looking at, with a recognition that it is incredibly expensive to live in Alaska. Uh, we'll put that out there. So, and I promise you specifically, we did a COLA survey 
uh, or yeah, poll survey just this last uh, month, and I made sure that it was registered that GCI cost one hundred and seventy nine dollars a month for them. Okay, so so it's not what you want to hear, right? But they, they will go to the day room spaces, okay, in all the common areas. So we're getting that in there. And the day room spaces get sold for input for those. So it's there'll be cooking areas that are in there, social areas, and then a couple gate and then access uh, to to, to Wi Fi. Okay, anybody else? So just to jump on that safety question, uh, almost all the doors around the exterior of the barracks should have auto locking doors. Uh, people people open those doors, which allows free access in. As a CQ, uh, our expectations is you make sure that those are secure, so you can funnel every uh, everyone through a centralized point and ensure who's inside and outside the barracks. Okay. That way, I'm not sure what to do with my hands. I the microphone. Um, I had a couple of people that asked questions. Uh, one was about the PLC graduation, and the other one was about AWOL. Uh, if you'll hit me up after that, I'll go into specifics on that. Okay, so what makes Fort Wayne right great? What makes every installation great? It's the people. It's the soldiers, the families, the civilians, you know, getting out, meeting people, and doing new things. So, um, you know, we're investing a lot into this organization, uh, into Fort Wainwright. Up at the highest levels of the Army, uh, they see where we stand and they are putting a significant amount of money uh, into making this better. The leadership that's standing out here are working and have been every day to make it better. So, but you, are 99% of the solution. So we've got some requirements we're going to put on you. Most of you have heard this already. Uh, the first thing I'm going to ask is don't trust everything you've heard in the past. Now, if you heard there was raw chicken, if you heard the gym was bad, if you heard the commissary stuff is going bad, don't pay, pay no attention to that. Go and see it for yourself. I promise you, in these places, they have made great improvements. Go see it for yourself, and if it's not what you think, give us more feedback. We will work hard to fix it. The next thing, a couple of things that we need um, is, is we need leaders. You know, today we sat in a, a meeting and we talked about kind of heroes in every organization. There were people pulled off on the side of the road. There were people in the wrong uniform uh, out in negative 35. And I'm talking flip flops and shorts and their car stalled. Uh, and leaders. Caring individuals stopped and helped them out. You know, they picked up pieces of trash. They, they took care of their insulation and the people that were around them. That's what we need. That's our expectations for every soldier um, and civilian in this insulation. Uh, you know, there's two types of people: people that identify problems and people that solve them. Okay, I, I'm sorry, and three, and people that do both. We need problem solvers uh, to get out there and fix things. So please. You know, if you see a problem, don't just point it out and go, it's broken. You know, if that dryer is messed up and it's not fixed, go find your first sergeant. He's the parish manager. He should be. He owns all that stuff. So we talked about caring, um, caring individuals, uh, and then we are all one big team. You know, regardless of what you think, there's nobody out there uh, you know, in, in this chain of command that just hates you because of who you are. You know, none of them hate you at all. You know, we want the best for every soldier. We want to be you know, ready to deploy, fight, and win. We want to take care of families, and we want to make your time in Alaska enjoyable. So tell us what's wrong. We will do our best to fix it, or we will explain to you why we're doing something different, because we can't make everything go fight. But we'll do our best to make everything better. So. That's all I have to say. Does anybody have any follow-on questions? Sir. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I couldn't get 3417 right now, sir. Uh, sir, um, I 
and then 10,000 won't be almost up 1,000 won't but we are having a lot of problems with 3417 as well right now. Um, we, that was one when I was there, it had a common room and also had a gym facility, but in 3417 we don't have anything like that right now. I know you guys are working on it right now. But, and also the males are doing 4, 4, 3417 and the females are doing in different barracks, which they have the, they have their own rooms to themselves and they have their bathroom that they're sharing. They're sharing the bathroom with everyone right now, like in the second floor, third floor, like that. So I was wondering why, like, how come the females are getting, like, the fair treatments for that and then the males are not? And also, how, like, and we are having, we are, we are getting complaints about, like, increase of sharp because we are sharing the rooms, I think. If you're so, we're, we got complaints saying, like, we got a, we got a complaint for sharks for males and specifically for our, our barracks. So I was wondering how we could come up with it, basically. So, so we'll address that specifically after this if you want to get with us. But in, in overall, uh, the overall architecture of the barracks is, is our, our goal is to have each unit uh, kind of uh, homogeneously inside of a certain barracks. Uh, so as barracks come up and come down for maintenance, people get switched around. Um, I can't answer why all the females are in there. I'll have to get with the leadership. Uh, we don't control uh, who goes in each individual room. That's a huge responsibility. But if you come up after this, uh, we'll get with we'll get with you, with the teammates, and, uh, and answer all your questions. Okay. So, so lastly, uh, this weekend. Uh, Special Swab from 125 passed in a, in a vehicle accident. Um, so, you know, they were driving from here uh, to Anchorage. Uh, they were part of the Fairbanks, uh, Fort Wainwright basketball team, and they were going down to play some people with Jaybear. Uh, vehicle got in an accident, flipped over. There were three soldiers trapped inside for over an hour. Uh, they, they got all of them out. Uh, unfortunately, Special Swab would pass. Uh, the two other soldiers uh, are going to be okay, you know. And in the end, you know, that team, you know, went through a tragic event, you know, getting together. They still went and they fought through and they won those couple of games. You know, and what I kind of mean by that is, don't let anything put you down with the camp. Keep in the fight. Uh, take care of each other. Uh, thank you for your service, and please, you know, be safe. And help somebody if they need help. All right, thank you.